Father, we pray you would take this word and make that real to us, that your people might know indeed that they are not (coughs) slaves but sons, heirs, and can address you today as Abba, Father. Do this wonderful work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. How do, you, how do you conceive of God as your father? In Greek, your pater, or in Aramaic, your Abba. How do you conceive of God as your father? Well, as a starting place, you might consider the quality of your, your own relationship with your earthly father. It's a good place to begin because when God created the world, He created the world and He placed in this world fathers. Fathers who in some sense represent Him. So, if you want to know about the fatherhood of God, you should look at the common grace you discover in your own earthly father. You might think of your earthly father like a shadow on the ground that is outlining the substance of the true thing, God in heaven, the heavenly Father. Only looking to your Father like this as a representation of God's fatherliness is always limited in scope. The fact is your earthly Father is a limited human human being. Uh, Perhaps in your life you've had to relocate away from your father. Let's say you had a good relationship with him. The army moves you a thousand miles away and now you must relate to your father over Zoom and phone calls and occasional visits here and there. Your dad's limited. Uh, You don't have access to his presence all the time. And then, of course, we understand that we live in a world populated with evil fathers. You have a father, perhaps, who knows that a forbidden relationship with his secretary might cost him his children. But in his selfishness, he chooses forbidden sexual sin over a familial life with his kids. Or we think of abusive fathers who are tyrannical at home and emotionally destroy their kids. And, and of course, the peak of the evil of fatherhood that we see in our day is when a man pressures his girlfriend to murder their child in abortion. And as you probably know, Church, we live in a society that is worst in the world when it comes to fatherless homes. Stat I read said almost 25% of U.S. children live with one parent at home, the vast majority almost always being a single mom. It's a rate that is number one in the world and more than three times the global average. And of course, the consequences of fatherless homes in society is disastrous. I mean, you can go look at the stats for yourself, but uh, a child in a home without a father is more likely to experience poverty, get pregnant as a teen, drop out of high school, go to prison, commit suicide. I mean, it's been said that the root cause of America's maladies is fatherlessness. Now, the glorious thing about the gospel is Christ has and does save families like this, orphans, children raised in single-parent households, and he does marvelous things through single moms, children in broken families. He does them for his own glory. You know stories of this. I know stories of this. It's a glorious reality of Christ in the gospel. But the point I want to show you is this. Nature itself is shouting out, children need a natural father 
desperately. And in fact, this proves to be a parable of a deeper spiritual need that all of us share. It's a need revealed in the full light of Scripture, namely, just as a child needs a natural father, your soul needs a heavenly father. Your soul needs God as father. And this heavenly father is revealed in Scripture most clearly as the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means that fatherhood is most ultimately defined not by your earthly relationship with your father, no matter how good or bad, but fatherhood is defined by God's own relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. If you want to see what fatherhood really is, see the father creating the universe through the son and then gifting the son all things. John 3, the father loves the son and has put all things into his hands. Or look at the son, the eternal son, enjoying the truth and presence of his father for all eternity. John 1, no one has seen God, but the only God, the one and only son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the father, he has made God known. If you want to see fatherhood, look at the Trinity. Now, Galatians 4 here, Paul speaks of us being adopted by this father in and through Jesus Christ. Uh, there's two other places where Paul speaks of this concept of our adoption as sons, Ephesians 1, Romans 8. What makes Galatians 4 unique is that Paul, unlike the other two texts, he explicitly ties our adoption to Christmas to the sending of the Father's precious Son into the world as a human being. You can hear it in that most famous text there in the middle of the, ver in the, middle of the passage, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. On Christmas Day, God the Father gave you a gift. And so let's consider this gift from the Father in three brief questions. God's gift at Christmas. Why do you need it? What precisely is it? How can you enjoy it? So let's answer these. First, God's gift at Christmas. Why do you need it? Well, notice out of the gate, Paul tells us, the plight of humanity, the problem that God is confronting and solving on Christmas morning. Look at verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, the essence of humanity's problem. If you have not partaken in the gift of Christmas, you are a slave. You are under the control of a hostile power. You are mastered by an external tyrant. But how could this be for you, Miss Independent? How can it be for you, Mr. Self-Made Man? How can it be for us? We live in the land of the free. We're free. But here, slavery is not spoken of as a description of your literal, economic, or political situation. It is a spiritual metaphor. It illustrates your soul slavery. You say slavery to what? Well, notice Paul defines it for you, verse 3 there. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, it's an interesting phrase, primarily because Paul, in chapter 3 of Galatians, has been ringing the bell 
repeatedly hitting it over and over again saying the Jews were enslaved to the law. Exodus 20, Mount Sinai, God comes down in fire, gives the law. You guys remember the Ten Commandments? Anyone? Yes. The Ten Commandments, the law covenant. And Paul's, the Jews are enslaved to the law. Only here, notice Paul uses this strange word. Uh, almost nobody understands what it really means exactly, though generally we, we get what he's talking about. He says the Jews are enslaved, the ESV has it, the elementary principles of the world, of the world. Now there is a legitimate debate about what these elementary principles of the world refers to. It could refer to demonic spirits. It could refer to worldly, elementary, religious doctrines, and I think there's some truth in that. Uh, scholar, uh, his name's Moo, Doug Moo, I, I'm kind of convinced by his explanation. Um, he says this word maintains its obvious meaning. Elements. Elements, so periodic table, remember your science class? Periodic table of elements. The elements are what the world is basically made of. Earth, wind, fire, earth, air, wind, fire, water. Isn't there a band named after that? I don't know. The, ba the basic physical components of the world. Why would Paul be comparing or associating the basic physical tangible elements of this world with the law covenant? Well, think of the law covenant, friends. The law covenant of Moses was filled with ceremonies, rituals that were physical, what you could see, taste, touch, feel. These rituals were things like sacrifices, temples, foods, holidays, and most pertinent to the Galatians here, <laughs> circumcision. The Jews were enslaved to the physical rituals of the law covenant. But w w why is he ta talking about elements? Why is he using elements, huh? This term elements. Well, in verses 8 to 9, drop your eyes down to verse 8. Keep in mind the Galatians were Gentile before they got saved. So they worshiped many gods, many, many deities. They'd make sacrifices to them. They'd have little statues of idols. Notice how Paul describes their pre-conversion condition as pagans. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved, same word, to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless, here's a word, elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be much uh, uh, again, once again. You see the idea? Pagan rituals to appease the gods. I make a sacrifice. The gods will bless my wife with fer fertility, bless my land with vegetation and crops. Make sacrifices, make prayers, make offerings. We'll get blessed. For unbelieving Jews, it looks almost the same, identical, doesn't it? Sacrifice, circumcision, Food loss, don't taste, don't touch, don't handle. Follow the ceremony, do this holiday. Paul's saying something like this. I, used, I lived in uh, Eastern Europe for a couple years, and uh, the dominant religion there was Eastern Orthodoxy. And uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, they had this massive church building in the center of the city. They called it a temple. You go in that temple, there's a big screen, and behind that screen is where the priests offer prayers and incense and the sacrifice of the mass and chant prayers that you can't understand. And in this auditorium, you walk in, there's stations, and at each station, there is an icon of a saint. And the worshipers can go from station to station, from saint to saint, and pray to them, asking them to Bless my wife, give her fertility, give my field crops, can throw in my offering to appease the gods. 
And as I'm in there watching this, I'm thinking, this is Judaism. And then I'm thinking, this is paganism. (laughs) But then I'm thinking, underneath it all, this is slavery to the law. It's slavery to the externals of religious rituals that cannot make you righteous before God. You participate in these rituals, whether from the Jewish law or pagan religion, it cannot eradicate sin. It cannot produce a righteousness that pleases a God who is angry with you, but you're convinced it does, so you return to the ritual, the physical element, over and over and over and over and over again, convinced that if I obey just right, I will be released from sin's power, and God will bless me with a divine blessing and salvation, only it makes matters Worse, Galatians 3, Paul says, the law is like a prison door slammed in your face. The intention of the law was to lock you in, to show you as as much as you try to obey God, you fail. You fail. Try harder. You fail more. What's being exposed? Your inability to obey God and please Him. What is being exposed is your slavery to sin's power, but for some reason you're self-deceived and go back to the physical elements of religion again and again and again, which only deepens your experience of bondage. It was true for the Jews under the law. It was true for the Galatians under their pagan idolatry. It is true for every human being from birth. Before we ever partake of this Christmas gift from God the Father, all of us are slaves to sin so that any attempt to be righteous by law or ritual only deepens our experience of bondage to the law. You can be a regular church attender, a lifelong church member, a Baptist deacon, a Methodist preacher, a Catholic priest, a faithful Bible reader and theologian, but unless you're delivered from the power of sin in your soul, your participation with religion only makes it worse. Ah, you say, I'm secular. I don't worship any religion. I just got dragged here this morning by my mom. I'm free from these religious ceremonies, really. Take a step back and examine your compulsive pattern of behavior this past week? Do you incessantly return to man's approval on social media? The mindless playing of video games? An incessant craving to shop and buy the right dress? Are you enslaved to debt, alcohol, drugs, porn, adultery? You keep going back, but what are they? They're physical, they're tangible. You think there's salvation there. You think there's some divine blessing that if you just get it, it will satisfy your soul. Now what is this, huh? That's a religion. It's your main, man-made secular religion. You're participating in the physical elements of your man-made religion. We are all slaves to sin and law. It's why you need Christmas. It's the liberating mission of God's Christmas gift. Friend, you need the liberating power of Christmas. And so that leads to question two, God's gift at Christmas. What precisely is it? What is it? Now kids, this is where you shine. Kids, who gets born on Christmas? Let me hear you. Jesus, you guys are brilliant. Praise God. Jesus, amen. God gives us a gift, Jesus, on Christmas morning. Only, who exactly is Jesus? Only, what exactly did Jesus do when he came? What did he accomplish? And, 
why was it necessary for Jesus to leave heaven and come in order to help you in any manner whatsoever? The fact is, if you don't understand these truths in detail and precision, you yourself will be vulnerable to the law. That is to say, to legalism, to reducing Christianity to earning salvation by ritual. And so Paul unwraps the gift of Christmas by explaining in detail Jesus' person, Jesus' work, Jesus' time. Jesus' person, we see it here in verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. So notice here, he's born of woman. It's clearly a reference to Mary's agonizing childbirth in a cattle stall. Now mom's in, in here. I want you to think about that for a second. Giving birth, not at home, not in a hospital, in a smelly cattle stall. Sheep and donkeys everywhere. No hospital bed, no nurse, no running water. You want to sign up for that? <laughs> but this here is, it's, it's amazing. This is God's chosen vehicle, listen, not merely to bring a baby into the world. That's true of every other birth. When you were born, a natural birth was the means by which God brought you into the world. Fair enough. But notice here, this messy, difficult childbirth was the means of God's sending. Did you catch that? In the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, how? Born of a woman. You hear the implication? Mary's labor of love was God's vehicle for sending the divine and fully eternal son into this world as a human being. The implication in how Paul writes it is, this son pre-existed his earthly life. He is the eternal and fully divine son, and he's come through a woman to take on humanity, a human nature. It makes this baby God and human. He grows up to become the God-man. Emphasis is on his human nature, which is important because Jesus Christ being human can now be the savior of not just Jews, but human beings. But notice here, Paul hastens to add the fact that Jesus was a Jewish man. Did you catch it? He was born under the law. And if you've been following with Galatians, this idea of being under something, under law, under guardians, under managers, it always refers to slavery under the power of sin. But when you stop and read this, Jesus was born under law. It can't mean that Jesus Christ himself was enslaved to the law or enslaved to sin. And you know that because verse 5 says, he came to redeem us who were under the law. Now if you have a, a man here and he's in a straight jacket, and another man here in a straight jacket, and this man wants to get this other man out, guess what? He can't. He's enslaved. He's bound. He can't help that guy who's also bound. But Jesus here is the liberator of human beings who are enslaved to the law. Implication, he himself was not a slave to the law. By his virgin birth, he bypassed Adam's sinful nature. Thus, he was the only Jew born under the Mosaic law, the only Jew ever able to fully obey the law covenant. It is incredible. 616, 19 commandments. He obeyed every single one of them perfectly. Don't covet your neighbor's oxen. He didn't. Don't lust. He didn't. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He did. As a Jewish man under the law. Why is Paul emphasizing the fact that he was a Jew, a fully righteous Jew, because he's been contrasting two covenants. God made a promise to Abraham 
and then God brought the law in. And his point is, this promise to Abraham was intended for Abraham and the son of Abraham. But who among us is worthy to inherit the promises of God given the fact we're lawbreakers and slaves to sin? Nobody. But when a righteous son of Abraham emerges and he fulfills the law and he obeys perfectly and now he stands as righteousness in righteousness and now he dies and now he rises as the perfect righteous and risen son of Abraham, he alone has claim on the promises made to Abraham. You see, you see the point. Yes, he was fully human. He can save Gentiles, but he was also fully righteous and became the heir of God. Jesus is God's heir. Jesus is God's heir. And that's important because of the work that God wants to accomplish through his son. So let's move from the person of Jesus, his person, to his work. Why did he come on Christmas morning? Verse 5, he came, God sent him to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Redemption. The context is the slave market. And a rich man goes to the slave market to purchase a household servant. The typical exchange, the man buys a slave and keeps the slave in the house as a slave. The purchase is merely relocating a slave from one master to another. It's relocation. But notice here, God sent Jesus Christ to make a payment not of relocation, but manumission. God sent Jesus to redeem, to make a purchase that liberates. And in, in Galatians 3, this purchase of redemption clearly refers to Jesus' work on the cross. Jesus, the God-man dying for sinners, God paying the price to set you free from law's penalty, law's power. Jesus Christ, he, he died on the cross to be punished in your place, to provide a full record of righteousness to trade places with you so that when you believe you're united to this righteous one and you take possession of Christ by faith and now God views you as having the perfect record of God's righteousness so that you are now qualified to be Abraham's offspring, God's heir, God's legal son with the right to his inheritance. The, purchase, the purchaser is God the Father. The price is Jesus' blood. The payoff is your adoption. This adoption means, beloved, if you're a Christian, your last name is changed. It is a legal change, a positional and legal change. You now are legally a member of God's household as a son and heir, not a slave. Now, I can imagine some of you thinking, oh, it's been a tough Christmas, you know. It's been tough on the pocketbook. Um... What would happen if, uh, you know, how would your fortunes change if uh, you got a name change and your name, your last name changed to, I don't know, let's say Gates or Musk, Zuckerberg, Buffett? That's a change of fortune, isn't it? If one of those men adopted you as, your, as their legal heir, oh my. Beloved, you have something better. Amen. Your name has changed. You bear the name of God. You're God's son. You have the same legal status as the eternal son of God. It's incredible. The one who rose from the dead gained the kingdom, or in Paul's language, inaugurated the new creation. And now, by virtue of his adoption of you, 
shares it with you. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, church, all things are yours. <laughs> all things are yours because you're an heir. Heir of the world, like Abraham, who was an heir of the world. That's his work. God purchased you out of slavery, from sin, from law, with the purchase price of Jesus to make you his own heir. So third, Jesus' time. This is very important, his time. It's important because Paul has been arguing about this issue of the law covenant. And the law covenant, Paul says in Romans, is good and righteous and holy. In fact, it's in your Bible. You can go read it. We don't cut out the law covenant. And so you need to understand what Paul is doing here. Paul is not saying the law in itself is bad. His point is the law is old. Notice we see God sends Jesus at a specific time, verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. When did God send Jesus? In the fullness of time. It echoes back to this household slave metaphor he gave in verses 1 to 2. This metaphor, uh, Paul says that there's an heir in the household, and there he is as a little child, he's a minor, and Theoretically, in prospect, he's the owner of the father's estate, but he does not yet take possession of all things in the household until the date that the father sets. Johnny, 20 years is all yours. It's the appointed time. It's the appointed time not merely to become a legal inheritance, that son already is, it's the appointed time to take possession and to enjoy the father's inheritance. And now Paul says, in Christ, you are free from the law. You are an heir in Christ. It means that the law covenant belongs to the old era before Christ came, an era that has passed away. You belong to the new era of fulfillment of sonship, where you have taken hold of God's kingdom promises God's promises to Abraham, God's inheritance. It means, dear beloved, you live in the time when the new creation inheritance promised to Abraham is yours right now. It is the fullness of time, Christian. And beloved, I want to tell you, you got to battle with sin, don't you? You got to battle with, with a sinful flesh. We all do as Christians. And sometimes you can get so entangled in your sin that you begin to think like this. You know what? I must be a slave to sin. And my only remedy is to try harder. Go to the law. Do some rituals. Go to church. Tithe. Make a confession. Paul's saying don't do that. In your battle with sin, that is the old era you are not enslaved to sin. You are not enslaved to law. You are a son. You feel guilty about sin today. Do not try to fix it by law. Hear God say to you in Christ, you are my legal heir. You are not enslaved to sin. Think that way. Reason with Paul like this. My time of slavery is over. My, my time of legalism is gone. God has paid for all of my sins and has adopted me as a son. Yes, I've sinned, but Christ paid for it, and I have the full record of Jesus' righteousness. Therefore, verse 7, you are not a slave. You are a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. God did it all. Amen. Do not fall prey to Satan's lie. You argue with Satan like that. I'm a son. God's gift at Christmas, what is it? Is deeper than just Jesus, isn't it? The gift of Jesus is death and righteousness, liberating you from sin's power to secure your legal adoption so that you have access to the new creation inheritance right now. That's a great Christmas gift. Final question, and briefly, how can you enjoy it? Are you enjoying Christmas? I hope you do. It's a glorious season. 
But there's a way you can enjoy God's, God's gift at Christmas. And it's what Paul here counsels the Galatian Christians to do, and he counsels them because he knows them personally. Chapter 3, we, we read that Paul came and preached the gospel to them. They believed the gospel, received the Spirit. They were doing miracles through the power of the Spirit. These enslaved idolaters were baptized, added to the church, and Paul can, so Paul in verse 6 can assert, you are sons. By the evidence of salvation I see in your life, and given the gospel I just expounded, you are sons of God. But, as a legal heir to God and his kingdom, there's an implication you need to grasp. And before I tell you what that implication is, let me give it to you by way of illustration. Let's say uh, you have this rich man here, and here he is, and he's a mega millionaire, got a mansion, business, makes millions a year, and uh, he's getting old, he's got three sons, and these sons, you know, um, they're not big fans of their dad, but the father, you know, these are the only offspring he has to leave his estate to. And you know, the father, he's been a bit cold in his life, been a bit preoccupied with work, neglecting the kids, and uh, it's just not a great relationship. But the heirs, the three sons, they're really interested in his stuff. I like that house. <laughs> He's got a Ferrari. I'll take that. And so the time comes. The father passes away. And this, the will is unsealed. And it's read name by name. You inherit a third. You inherit a third. You inherit a third. And all three sons curse the name of the father and says, I'll take it. And they go off to enjoy their father's stuff. The fact is, you can be a legal heir, but not really a son. And Paul says, not for the Christian. For the Christian, you're not just a legal heir. You also share in a relationship with your father. Notice how he puts it in verse 6. And because you are sons, here's what you need to imply. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. It is the gift of the new age, the gift of the indwelling spirit in your soul when you believed on Christ as revealed in the gospel. Are you an heir? You have the Spirit of God right now. And Paul here wants to highlight a specific ministry of the Spirit in your soul. Notice this last phrase. Crying, Abba, Father. It's probably better rendered the one who. The Spirit of God is the one who cries repeatedly, habitually, Abba, Father, more than likely, Paul means that the Holy Spirit who indwells every Christian enables you to address God just like this, to say to God, Abba, Father, in prayer. How did Jesus Christ address his God and Father in the Garden of Gethsemane? Abba, Father. It's why Paul here doesn't call the third member of the Trinity the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God's Son. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God's Son. And now the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, He influences your soul and enables you to experience a relationship with God like Jesus experienced a relationship with God. You know him and talk to him and experience him as your beloved father in prayer. In prayer, Paul says in Ephesians, through Christ we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. Likely Paul is alluding to what he says elsewhere. We should pray at all times in the spirit 
How do you enjoy the gift of your sonship, the gift of Christmas God the Father has given you, Christian? Pray. Pray knowing that Jesus has redeemed your soul from the curse of the law. Pray knowing that you are a legal heir of God and that can't change. Pray knowing that you have access to your new creation gift and inheritance right now by the Spirit. Pray knowing that you have the greatest gift God the Father has ever given you in Jesus, a deep and intimate relationship with himself as your Father. Beloved, it is not an exaggeration to say that the climactic gift for you at Christmas is prayer. The experience of a rich relationship with God as your Father through prayer. Are you experiencing Him, church, as your Father? You can. You can right now. The Father has opened Himself to you. He's given you the Spirit. He's brought you near. By the Spirit, you can talk to Him as the Father who loves you like He loved His Son. What a wonder. Uh, one of the challenges of having a home office, and you might know this, if you have a home office with a toddler at home, is uh, occasionally I'll hear a little, knock, little knuckles knocking on my door like that. And at that time, like it happened this morning at sermon crunch time, you got to finish. No. That time I got a decision to make. Do I open the door and bring him into my presence? Or do I keep the door closed, stay silent, hope he gets a clue? I don't know. <laughs> but there's a moment of decision, isn't there? Got the things I need to do. Beloved, the door of your Father in heaven is always open. He decided to open it once and for all at Christmas when he departed from his own son. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to purchase you for adoption, to give you the indwelling spirit who by his power cries, Abba, Father, even now. Beloved, this is the greatest gift imaginable. You have access to God as Father right now. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's door and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Beloved, just as a child needs a natural father, your soul needs a heavenly father. And Christmas says, by God's gracious work alone, you have one. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, we marvel that we would be called sons of God not only that we would have your stuff, the new creation, but that we would have you. An intimate, deep, personal, warm, satisfying, never-ending relationship with you as our Father. I pray for your people that they might know this reality by the ministry of the Spirit. By the Spirit, Father, let us stir up our prayer lives to commune with you. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen.